for African burial ground and eight other Manhattan sites. And for those of you who were here early, I was talking about some of the other sites. Uh, this morning, the National Park Service is very honored and pleased and delighted to support and host the third annual Spirit of Peace Conference. Uh, the Spirit of Peace Conference is going to convene within the area of Lower Manhattan, many considered to be the first African-American institution down here. Um, the African Burial Ground National Monument physically and spiritually embodies the goals, purposes, and objectives of this conference. Together, we may objectively provide opportunities to respectfully engage collective and transgenerational historic trauma disorders and correct these misinformed disorders with the appropriate and necessary healing approaches. Many activists in the New York City area and the descendant community of the burial grounds surely felt that the enslaved Africans buried within the graveyard rose up in 1991 to correct the historically incorrect record. Mm -hmm. Prior to 1991, African forced migration and chattel slavery to the Americas was considered to be an illness relegated to Southern United States and Latin America, and it wasn't believed to be in colonial New York. We know through the rediscovery of the burial ground of an enslaved population that compromised or com comprised over 10, 20% of the New York colonial population. So over 20%, one out of five New Yorkers were enslaved Africans. Prior to the discovery, um, and it really wasn't a redis it was a rediscovery, not a discovery. Uh, federal construction projects, because they were building a federal building here, uh, require under Section 106, they're required to do a cultural study of the area when a future building is going to be built in uh, anywhere in the United States. In the late 1980s, historical research was conducted in the city's museums and archives to find previous archaeological maps and documentation to ter determine if there were any adverse effects on any cultural resources as required by Section 106. A colonial burial ground containing close to 10 to 15,000 enslaved Africans was found buried 30 feet underneath what is now Lower Manhattan today. The burial ground reached 6.6 .6 acres of Lower Manhattan and was in use from the 1630s to 1795, so a long time. 419 skeletal remains were exhumed and sent to Howard University for examination and then they were placed in a hand-carved coffin from Ghana, the coffins, in 2003. And it was called a cradle moving ceremony. And they removed the remains back from Washington, D.C. to New York City's South Street Seaport. And that was the port or the site of the original slave market in New York City. And they were reinterred next to the external memorial that was then created and completed by Ronnie Leone in 2007. In February of 1993, the footprint of African burial ground was de designated as a New York City landmark. Um, and then in 1993, later on in the year, it was de designated a United States National Historic Landmark. And in 2006, the land of the burial ground was designated as the 390th unit of the National Park Service. So it took a long time. Both the African Burial Ground National Monument and the Spirit of Peace Conference promote peace, justice, and strong institutions. We have a shared commitment of teaching the importance of leaving no one behind through global participation with established institutions and historic educational partnerships. The historic viability of the African Burial Ground National Monument's ethical and moral, moral ma mandate to the global civil society and communities will continue to encourage multicultural partnerships, and inclusive institution programs at all levels. So this really fits into our mission, which is why we're thrilled you're here today. Again, the National Park Service would like to thank the Spirit of Peace Conference for the continuing support and dedication to peace, security, and developmental sustainability. We look forward to our continuing partnership, our friendship, and institutional educational relationship with mutual developmental goals of leading Again, on behalf of Superintendent, I'd like to welcome you all to the African Burial Ground National Monument, and I know it's going to be a really awesome week. Um, for you all, um, last year was really, truly.
truly moving. And just looking at the agenda for this week, it's going to be a very moving week. So um, enjoy the conference. Thank you all for coming and taking time out of your busy lives. And especially for those of you who travel from so far away, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, hello, uh, welcome. My name is William A. Verdone, and I'm chairman of African Views. First, I want to mention Nelson Mandela, who continues to be a tsunami in human dignity and a continuing force for peace. Two things I would like to mention here. The world is changed by our example not by our opinions. And secondly, try to avoid toxic people. Positive people look for solutions to problems. Negative people search for problems for the solutions. Before I begin my brief comments, I must acknowledge, acknowledge our tireless executive director, Mr. Wally, Idris Ajibade, who is not in the room. Wally? He's right behind you. <laughs> right oh, here. Oh, Wally, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't leave, because I have to tell these wonderful people that I said tireless executive director, because I get emails from him at 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. When do you sleep? <laughs> what vitamins do you take? <laughs> Not the cognac, eh? <laughs> the Spirit of Peace Conference, like the one we did last year, brings together, again, traditional and native rulers, monarchs, government representatives, professionals, educators, corporations, and many institutions to discuss, among other issues, peaceful coexistence, sustainable development, and trade. Honest and frank discussions will be the hallmark on ways to encourage and promote mutual esteem, cultural honesty and respect, conciliation, positive social interaction, and opportunities to celebrate cultural diversity. As I may have mentioned in the past, the United Nations adopted the two the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Developmental Goals. And as our executive director recently stated, UNESCO's recognition of global culture initiatives is an enabler and a contributor to sustainable development, which we will touch upon as these days unfold. Today, therefore, the spirit of peace will encourage solidarity for humanity. I want to conclude was something I recently read. We can't go back and change the beginning, but we can start where we are and change the future. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, just like with being uh, before me, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of your dignitaries, uh, your highnesses, excellencies, and uh, other uh, distinguished uh, guests. I speak um, in my capacity as uh, uh, Vice Chair of the African <coughs> Views. Uh, my name is Isaiah Chapala natively uh, Zambian, but I, I prefer global citizenry. Um, it's been a, a privilege for me to uh, work with uh, African views, and in that spirit, I'd like to acknowledge our hardworking executive director, uh, Wale. Uh, he's the person behind uh, virtually all the strands uh, of this uh, uh, 
organization. Um, I also like to pay tribute to Barbara for her insightful remarks. And also, speaking as she was, on behalf of Ms. McKenna Superton, to acknowledge the very graceful and I'll say more than generous hospitality that we have enjoyed um, uh, from the park. And, um, and the last, last, last year, we, we, we were privileged to hold this, uh, the second um, annual at the Federal Building. Um, before we met, started meeting as, I mean, formally, uh, as somebody, one of us asked about the cost for holding an event here. And the thought uh, crossed my mind that something that is priceless is the grace and the generosity uh, that we have enjoyed uh, from our host. So thank you again, Barbara, and thank you, uh, Superintendent, for hosting us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we, we are meeting at a time, and Bill has referenced the uh, very important uh, program that the United Nations adopted two years ago, um, the Agenda 2030. And we are meeting in the third year of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted. That's uh, some 17 Sustainable Find us all. And that across, that cut across the superficial boundaries of race and others. And that's where I believe our organization I can uh, use at the spirit of peace uh, <coughs> has to play a very And that's where, why it's all the most significant we are meeting in this place. Place of the African burial ground. Now calls us to the spirits of those, our ancestors, many of those buried here, and even before. And that spirit of solidarity of peace, of unity, of seeing God of many names in the other place, of fighting bigotry, <coughs> racial bigotry, gender injustice, econ injustice. And that's a spirit, I believe, that can enable us as we proceed on this collective journey to leave no one behind. We are also meeting at a time, as we all know, that we are commemorating the 50th anniversary of the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. And also the 100th anniversary, centennial 
anniversary of uh, Nelson Mandela. There are two individuals of African descent, but above all, they preached a gospel and practiced it, not just for Africans, but for humanity as a whole. They preached a gospel and practiced and died for the realization of the respect for human dignity of all. So this is very significant, and as all of you know, many of us participated in activities marking the 50th anniversary of MLK, and many of us will be commemorating as well Nelson Mandela's centennial celebration at United Nations tomorrow, July 18, is Nelson Mandela's day. So for most of us, and some of us who were teenagers, when these giants were practicing what they preached, I come from a country, Zambia, which became independent, October 24, just a few months after Nelson Mandela was incarcerated for 27 years. And Zambia hosted, hosted the entire executive of the African National Congress because they had to flee South Africa. African National Congress was banned in South Africa. So they fled and Zambia played host. The entire executive of the African National Congress, then led by his legal partner, Oliver Tambo, and thousands of our brothers and sisters, members of the African National Congress. And we hosted them for 35 years until after Nelson Mandela was liberated. So for us, for me, and I was growing up as a small boy, the Tron joined the Foreign Office. Nelson Mandela played a very, very instrumental role in my outlook and my attitude to one and all. Just like MLK, again. Martin Luther King was one who preached and practiced what the gospel is all about. So in that spirit, I'd like to say that uh, it's important for us for us to pray above all. Pray to the God of inspiration who inspired his servants, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela with his dream of racial harmony, economic justice. And for all people of faith, especially to ensure that they make this dream a reality. Another prayer, I think, that we have constantly, even in meditation, we have to pray a prayer to the God again of all names, of many names, to free us from fear. And this is important. Free us from fear. Free us from inaction. Free us from indifference. Especially when others, others preach racism, sexism, and xenophobia. This is happening, it's going on right here in our country and in many other countries. And it, by freeing us, we also pray that God will grant us the courage and the strength to speak up. Here in New York, we say when you see something, say something. But that should go beyond this. Like when we see an act of injustice, even when perpetrated against somebody who does not look like you, does not worship like you, we have to speak up because it's only to, by acting together 
that we are going to put an end to injustice. So to continue to pray, pray to stand up, to speak up, and to be heard in support of the dignity of all human beings and of all countries. This is the cause that MLK Martin Luther King, the cause that Nelson Mandela fought for. And so by doing that, like us, our motto is spirit of the peace and the theme spirit of the peace. Not only are we going to be liberated, but we will be liberating. It's through that liberation that we are going to accomplish the momentous goal of peace. Lastly, let me end by again referencing Martin Luther King's triple evils, in fact, to some of which I've spoken to, the triple evils Martin Luther King referenced. And even Nelson Mandela, the thing that he fought for. One, first one is racism, discrimination, simply because someone looks different. So that's the evil of racism. Second one was the evil of poverty. Poverty is an evil. And the third one of violence. You recall that these triple evils, they are of a character that um, they demand courage. And this is what we have to preach and practice, courage. Martin Luther King, uh, we recall that when he addressed, it was at Riverside Church. Riverside Church, 3rd of April, 1967, one year before it. He preached a sermon on violence. And by so doing, he spoke very, very strongly against the Vietnam War. And what happened to him? He lost even some of the closest friends. They left him. Why? Because he was speaking against an evil which the United States government, from his perspective, was participating in. But through courage, he's contributed to a movement which ultimately led to the end of the Vietnam War. So let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, that we, we are meeting at a very challenging period, challenging times. Therefore, when, as we meet, we cannot expect, we cannot hope to make a contribution without recourse to the spirits of our ancestors, without recourse to our shared values, the spiritual, the moral, the ethical values, which bind us all, regardless of our superficial differences. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. There are a number of people I would like to introduce now. They're going to make some keynote addresses by cultural, institutional, and faith elders and faith leaders. And please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. When you hear your name, please come up. And at that point, we all will be up, so there would be a wonderful opportunity for photographs. Um, the Professor Akav Hudegbe, Grand Mufti, Imam Konati, Minister Nini Uchi, Reverend Ulysses, Chief Wampiniquin, Ambassador Abid, 
and Queen Diambi. Please come up. Thank you very much. With no particular order, please introduce yourselves and then we welcome your comments. May we begin from the far right? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. My name is Suleiman Kamati, resident imam of Masjid Aqsa Salam here in Mannheim, spiritual leader of United African Congress, general secretary of the Council of African Imams in America, vice president of Harlem Islamic Leadership Council. Originally from Cote d'Ivoire, which is Ivory Coast. So I continue. Yes, so the reason we're here this morning or this afternoon is that uh, we're here for peace and harmony, which is a very important because without a global peace, there is no end. God himself, call himself God of peace. That's the reason we, in our tradition as Muslims, we pray five times a day. After every prayer, we supplicate ourselves to our Lord by seeking the peace, by saying this, Allahumma anta salam, the meaning of it, O oh our Lord, you the Lord of peace, embrace us with peace. We <coughs> embrace us with peace. Greet us with peace and accept us in your paradise, which is the house of peace. When you see when Adam was created, uh, uh, father, biological father, and the group of angels came towards him. And they greet him by peace. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. And he said, Wa alaikum salam. You see, when you greet your brother with a peace, the tranquility, you know, the trust. You are building the trust and tranquility and love between you. Even though you don't know each other. But with salam, you open your door. You open, you know, your heart for him. So peace is a very, very important. But in closing, peace start with yourself. In your household, with your wife, your children, and then your community, then the country, then global peace. Because if you don't make peace with your wife or your husband, 
you're not successful, you're not a good father, you're not a good mother. But we, in our time, we don't focus on youth. We don't focus on women. And God has given a power to women and they are a beautiful creation of God. So let us greet our brothers and their sisters with peace. With a peace there is no color. With a peace there is no nationality. With a peace there is no country. We are in this together. So I greet you with peace. Thank you. My dear brothers and sisters, my name is Dr. Mufti Munir Ahmad Ahun. I'm the chairman of Al Munir Foundation, New York. I live in Queens. My parents originally from Turkey and I born in Pakistan. And uh, I have a TV channel, Rahm TV channel. I have a small message for you today. First of all, I thankful to the management of Secret Peace uh, um, Civil Peace uh, organization today and they gave me a chance to speak some uh, word and uh, make a tour for them. I just recited one verse from Holy Quran where Qala Ibrahim Rabbi Jalahaza Baladan Amina Varzuk Ahlo Mina Thamara. The translation of verse and when Abraham prayed, O oh my sustainer, make this land peaceful and grant its people uh, fruitful provision. As children of Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, who is the leader of humanity and head of all religion. We stand united to enlighten ourselves with his prayer after he migrated to the most central and diverse land of Makkah. His prayer is quoted in this verse from Holy Quran that I just recited in which he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for peace. For peace, economic prosperity and cultural harmony in the same order. He asked for peace before provision and harmony because everything is based on the foundation of peace. Without peace, all other benefits of the humanity become meaningless. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and protect from all evils and uh, we uh, give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala peace and harmony in this world. Amin. Ya Rabbi Amin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most beneficent. First, I'm going to thank every single person here for coming for such a sacred cause. And I'm going to thank my brother Wali. Where is he? For organizing this wonderful program and everybody who helped him, all his team. Thank you so much. I'm just going to start with a brief uh, introduction to add on to uh, my Honorable uh, Mufti Saab. Uh, he has been very humble, uh, but I'm going to tell you that he's been honored to be named as the Grand Mufti of America. So we are very much blessed that he is here with us. And uh, on my special request, he joined us for this uh, uh, blessed uh, you know, day. 
peace. We talk about peace. We can talk for days and days, months and months and years and years. But peace does not come without justice. Today, the injustice all around the world against the minorities, against people of color, against even with people of uh, no color, white, browns, blacks. So wherever there is injustice, there cannot be peace. By the way, I forgot to introduce myself while becoming very excited to introduce uh, Honorable Grand Mufti. <laughs> My name is Ambassador Malik Nadeem Abed and I am the Secretary General of International Human Rights Commission. Uh, that is an IGO intergovernment organization. Uh, we fight and uh, stand for the peace and the human rights all around the world. And I'm joined today with my wonderful, wonderful colleague, uh, Ambassador Fodeh Bansure, uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister and Representative uh, to the United Nations. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Fodeh Bansure. Your work is admired every single day. Thank you so much. So peace cannot be achieved without justice. So being an organization fighting for the justice and the human rights all around the world, I can tell you that we can keep on praying for justice and we'll, we will not be given justice unless we treat and we start treating people with respect and dignity. My Honorable Imam started with a beautiful thing that the justice starts from your home. And I'm going to, with your permission, Imam, I'm going to add the saying of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he said that treat your women, your wives with respect. Those of you who respect the, your wives are good and I am the best among you. So in other words, he said, I treat my wives the best in the world. So the peace starts at home. Once we start respecting our own wives, our own daughters, our own sisters, our own neighbors, and we treat people with respect, and especially starting with women, Believe me, we will achieve peace very soon. Okay. And with this, I'm going to pass on to my uh, next door neighbor, uh, the Honorable Queen. So after that, I would request both my Imams and uh, uh, Grand Mufti uh, at the end to pray, uh, especially for the peace in the world. Thank you very much once again, and Jazakallah. Na tondo li botondi, na pesi nguya, na bato onyo so basali awa. I just introduced, I said, in the name of God and in the name of ancestors, I give thanks for this present moment, for the ability to be here today all together. My name is Mukalenga Mukaji Diambi, Queen Diambi of Congo. And I'm Queen of the Bena uh, Chiamba of the Luba Empire. So I'm from the Luba tribe. Congo. And I'm very honored and I am very pleased to be here with all of you to share this moment in reflection. Our ancestors um, who have been around for hundreds of thousands of years um, understood that in order for us to move forward, we have to know how to live with each other. And we have to also know that because we believe God is in everything, then in everyone God is. So when we understand that we have to honor our friend, we have to honor our partners, we have to honor our neighbors as if we were right in the presence of God, then we come in a peaceful manner to uh, greet and to interact with each other. So the peace and, the, and the, the, the prayer for peace is actually a behavior we choose to have. But we want to live as a prayer every day, meeting everyone. And I believe that justice is always from the same, fall from the same tree as peace, as my colleague just spoke about. We have to be in peace to recognize that we have to uh, act in justice. We have to, do have to act and treat the other as we wish to be treated. So I'm very honored to meet everyone today and to pray with the honorables um, you know, leaders of uh, different confessions. As in Africa, we also have uh, many different confessions, but primarily our ancestors just practice spirituality on a daily life because spirituality were just imbued in everything we did so that we can uh, create an environment in which everyone was respected and everyone could thrive 
and and uh, you know able to look at each other as part of a community that would have to work towards the future together. So thank you very much. Friends and sisters, dear friends, the peace of God be with you. Brothers and sisters, peace be with you. I am Reverend Daniel Ulis. Originally from Haiti, I am the General Secretary of Haitian Clergy. We have thousands of uh, churches throughout the United States. We train pastors and they form churches. For the past 50 years, we've been in New York and from, uh, from Brooklyn, we train Haitian American pastors who are now out of the United States. I am also the General Secretary of Haitian Diaspora, where we have Haitian American professionals throughout the United States, bankers, doctors, and you name it, serving the Haitian American community. I'm also on the board of the National Asian American Republican Assembly. I am very close with the Asian community. I'm on the board of uh, the Chinese company where I, I work with the Asian. And it's important to note that within that Asian community, I work very closely with the Bangladeshi many other communities people when they talk about asia they don't understand it's not china asia is a broad a continent with a lot of uh, continent, a lot of people and i realized from my work we took the asian american republican group that there are also marginalized asian community such as bangladesh and many other countries that are not very opulent they don't have a lot of money so that gives me an opportunity to work and assist the Asian community in my vintage friend. I also work with some Pakistanis uh, pastors in all the communities, Indian. So God gave me that opportunity to work and serve him in this capacity. And in Washington, I uh, work very closely with a lot of people from San Leon. And I have a very good friend who worked for the city of New York Police Department, who's also from San Leon. I got to give it up to work with all these people to really See, I can work with peace. I am the chairman of the Caribbean American Republican Assembly, where Haitians and Trinidadian people from all those places, they have issues. And in such a time as this, you all know what's going on in the political landscape. And I am happen to, I happen to be one of the clergy who was in Washington who have access to all this denomination to pray with the president. So. I am also here in New York to work for peace, to bring all the communities together. And what a privilege to be a part of such a gathering with various denominations, Iman and, and various denominations, various uh, faith. This is respect, love, and understanding. I bring you a lot of greeting from Haiti. God be with you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. When um, some people started <coughs> speaking here today, I heard a lot of protocols being observed. Your Royal Highness, Your Majesty, dignitaries, ambassadors. Um, instead of saying all protocols observed, I would like to respectfully request that all protocols are temporarily put aside. Because if we're talking about peace here, the first thing is for all of us to see ourselves as brothers and sisters on the same level, Good. even if temporarily. It doesn't take away from who you are, what you've achieved, but it's in recognition of the fact that when God created us, he created all of us equal. So sometimes it's these titles and positions that bring about the oppression that we're suffering in society. That having been said, my name is Nini Oke Uche. I'm a mother of seven, a wife of one. Um, I have the privilege. <laughs> I have the privilege of serving my country, uh, Nigeria, as a minister. Nigeria's permanent represent um, Nigeria's permanent mission to the United Nations here in New York. This is my third posting, and it's a huge privilege. I've been with my foreign service for 24 years now, 
and this is my third posting. And um, more relevant to why we're gathered today, I'm an assistant pastor, an ordained assistant pastor with the Redeemed Christian Church of God. It's a worldwide ministry that has a presence in 196 countries of the world. And so I practice here as a diplomat by day, and then by night I'm an assistant pastor. <laughs> But all the same, it's a privilege to be here. I wasn't sure about the format things would take, so bear with me while I just try to churn out a few points. So I speak from a standpoint of the Bible, but from a heart point of inclusivity, in recognition of the fact that we are all children of God, the creator of the universe. It's also important for us to realize that if indeed we're all children of God, then we're children. And so we must have hearts like children. Part of the problem as we grow older and we become so dignified and we achieve so much, we depart from having a heart like a child. Why do I say this? I say this because we're all people of faith. There may be different faiths, different ways of worship, but our hearts must be like children for us to really be people of faith. Many people, if we sit back and check our hearts, they're so proud and so elated and so lofty that we might have lost it along the way. So it's a subtle reminder that no matter how old we are, let us keep our hearts like hearts of children. That way, we can really be people of faith. Now, the reason why we're gathered here today, it's not a novel concept. When I was studying about the conference, I realized that the World Interfaith Harmony was actually introduced on the 23rd of September 2010 at the United Nations General Assembly by His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan. So today we champion and celebrate the spirit of peace in this very special conference. But, um, I think it's important, again, moving forward, that we learn to focus on what binds us and not so much what divides us. In religions across the world, Christianity, Islam, Hindu, Buddhism, Grail adherence, there are two things I've noticed that are like a common thread going through all of them. And one is likening God unto a light. I'm sure that's familiar to most of us here. Likening him unto a light that lights up our path and shows us the way. The second thing I've noticed that is common is what some people call the law of karma, we call the law of harvest. The fact that what you sow is going to be what you reap. Now if we forget everything else, but we see God as a light to guide us, and we believe that what we sow is what we we'll reap, then automatically we'll treat our neighbors <coughs> because we will do unto others as we want them to do unto us. And so the principles and concepts are actually not so complicated. At the UN, we like to make things very complicated and very complex so we can feel very clever. But when it comes to faith and our belief, it's actually um, very simple. So when we talk about peace, you know, it's a rare treasure in our world today. It's eluded us in so many ways. But there are two aspects I also want us to think about. One of the reasons why peace might have eluded us in one way or another, it might just be that there are some categories of society that we have not placed in proper position. And that's first of all our traditional leaders, spiritual leaders, indigenous leaders. In the world today, we seem to feel that politicians, technocrats, diplomats are the ones that have all the keys. <coughs> but this is not so, because we cannot forget who we are, where we come from, and the foundation on which we stand. So I'm so happy to see that due regard and respect is being given to the kings and the queens and the pastors and the imams and the elders and the traditional leaders. Another very important group are women. Now forgive me to say this, but the fact of the matter is that women manage the first and most important category of society, which is the family. You know, and we can't sweep that under the carpet. If women manage the family, if women build the homes, then why not on a larger scale? 
Now, I'm not talking about women taking over, you know. I'm not talking about women disrespecting or sidelining men. But I'm talking about women being involved, included, and carried along. Because women are builders. We'll, women are birthers. Women are nurturers. We grow everything put in our hands. And so if we want peace to reign, it's an exercise in futility, not bringing the women into it. We naturally have larger hearts, you know. I mean, you have to have a very large heart to have all these kids and breastfeed and all those things that the men can't do. And I think that needs to be recognized, you know. When there is um, peace, even in a home, that's when the women are happy. If the man is happy, the woman isn't happy, there's no peace. Does anyone agree with me? Can you just yes, go like this? You know, so let's break it down. The other category is the youth. I feel a little bit sad because I don't see so many young people here. We keep saying that the youth hold the key to the future. Yes, they do, but what are we doing to prepare them to approach that door where they're going to use the key? You know, it is very important. One of the distinguished speakers earlier on talked about the fact that we can't do much about today, but we can do a lot about tomorrow. Yes, we can plan today for tomorrow because they say, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. But tomorrow is in the hands and the hearts of the youth. When I was at Post in, in Brussels, I think that was 2002 to 2006 or so, the women in my church had to have an emergency meeting. Why? Because of what kids were being taught in schools. It was like we were paying school fees for our kids to be untaught everything we taught them. And we were worried. But what we came up with is that we cannot control what the world puts into our children, but we can control what we put into our children, and we can control how much space we leave for anyone else to put anything into our children. And so I think if we're really interested in peace, lasting peace, today and tomorrow, we have to focus on the young ones, so that if we have not done so well, we're, we're going extinct, we're on our way out but we can make the tomorrows even better for our children. I have so much I'd like to say, but I know that um, there isn't so much time. So if I have the chance, I will later. But I just want to welcome everyone. I just want to thank everyone, especially the organizers, for this opportunity to be here. It is such a privilege. And I want to thank you for having given me this much of your ears and your time and your attention. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Let's give us another round of applause there. Great speakers, right? Great speakers. Okay. Uh, we have one more speaker here. Um, with the permission of my senior uh, master of ceremony here, uh, Honorable Siddiqui Wai. Uh, most of you know him as... Uh, a community activist and uh, somebody who is ad advocating for minorities for years in this city and around the United States and include Africa and all over the world. Uh, Honorable Siddiqui Wai need no introduction, but I, I take this honor and privilege because he's somebody I hold in high esteem. And uh, not only that we are from the same country, but we are together in one in humanity. That is the key. Honorable Siddiqui White, please. Thank you. Good morning, or good afternoon. As you can see, you are moving me from one place to the other. I'm not even supposed to be sitting there. But uh, I'm just here today. I want to, first of all, uh, not disagree with my sister, but protocol matters. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the chairman, give him a big round of applause. And also the ambassador, the excellency, who was here earlier. And uh, let me just say, I call these guys my partners, my comrades. And uh, there isn't an incredible human being that loves preserves our culture and tradition, and Brother Wali Idris. Give them a and of course, 
the guy that always tells me what to do. Sometimes I don't listen. His Excellency Ambassador for the, for the Ambassador. Quickly, I have to believe in because I'm the policy advisor to the police commissioner. And as you know, you are on the clock. So I have to go back to the office because somebody's waiting for me at one o'clock, Your Excellency. So no disrespect. And, uh, but I want to just say one or two things. When you talk about peace, peace starts with ourselves first. If you're not at peace with yourself, you cannot radiate peace to others. For the African diaspora constituency in the United States, let me give you some numbers. There are eight million Africans born in Africa that reside here. This is not make-believe, eight million people. We're not going anywhere. We're staying here because we are contributing to this economy, we're contributing to this society, and whether you believe it or not, the world is now a global village. So, when we come together in these kinds of gathering, it means we have a common denominator, our humanity. So I'm here today to end on that note, Thank my brothers for having done this. And as president and the national spokesperson of Africans born in Africa in the United States, I was also the first African ever to run for citywide office in the city of New York as public advocate. I got 14,000 votes. That's not the credential. I'm just here to say thank you, Wally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, the distinguished panelists, and of course, my own spiritual leader, Elijah Suleiman Karate. I thank you very much. Before, before we conclude, uh, there is one more person I would like to introduce, but I would like to pick up on something you said. I'm a board member of the Women's College connected to the University of Rajasthan in India. You empower a woman and you empower her <coughs> That's the matter. Uh, there's a, a unique artist that I would like to introduce. <coughs> and after that, I would like the, uh, the prayer ceremony to take place and then, of course, lunch. Uh, Mr. Johnny Liu is a fantastic artist and he was here for the last time when we did a Bruce Lee celebration, and I would like to introduce him right now, Mr. Johnny Liu. Uh, thank you, everybody came in, thank you. Today, the way I, I going to explain the East, West, uh, peace solution between East, West, uh, uh, I'm in the United States for uh, 34 years. The way I see the between the east side and west side, because in, in east, we love dragon. No matter in the Korea, Japan, uh, Bhutan, Nepal, or uh, uh, India, uh, many, many countries, about 3.5 billion people, they love dragon. In the west, in other reason, maybe in other way. Uh, first, I say thank you for the worry I chose him to work in together. But the important I talk about Dragon, special in imagination, special for tomorrow is the Mandela uh, uh, Peace Conference. I want to explain. It. The in the United Nations they have a one uh, a Dragon statue about uh, three floor high. They kill a Dragon. <coughs> You go to the uh, United Nations, they kill a dragon. The, the, and the, 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 the knife, the top is closed. I uh, said, this one donation by the Russia. The Chinese government, uh, even ambassador of the United Nations, they're scared to talk about this one in front of everybody. 
but I am the uh, uh, World Peace Foundation people. I will explain for you. They kill the dragon uh, in the United Nations, in the entrance. So that's why in China, <coughs> last, few, uh, 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 last, last year, they knocked down 2,000 church. Remember, the Bible not allowed selling in China. Speak again. Bible not is illegal selling in China. I big surprise for a few months ago. Bible not allowed selling in China. Because if this one didn't point out uh, to understand to uh, Kennedy Israel, right, they were angry forever. The China government they keep quiet, but they are very angry. So why you kill my dragon? But uh, the anyway, <coughs> I told the dragon. The reason why I'm here. Uh, because uh, we developed for, uh, for the uh, 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 war peace, dragon war, <coughs> the one that uh, you might chance to uh, later I show everybody else on the dragon. Try to, uh, because the, uh, 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 Donald Trump being the China a few months ago, the uh, President Xi, he told the down, uh, the Donald Trump, so we are the dragon people. Means, uh, uh, 1.3 billion people, the yeah, dragon people. 1.5 billion people, dragon people. But the United States is a killer dragon. But also the 3.5 million people, about 50 percent worldwide, is a lot of respect dragon for already many many thousand years. So uh, so we are happy to uh, I working with the Wally to develop for, for the uh, dragon peace war. Try and try to this time our future. Donate for 200 countries around the world. So uh, give them the special gift. Say, we, we are one, uh, the village is one, one big village. <coughs> we don't need angry here, we get there. We don't want to uh, uh, knock down the church and we say, uh, 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 burn the Bible. We need peace. So we are uh, talking about the, uh, uh, should we have war, peace, solution. Solution should be respect each other, not try to uh, continue for another 100 million years to kill each other. So anyway, thank you. I'm happy to have chance to speak in there. <laughs> now I, I try to have a, a, a dry game piece of war. Try to have an area about uh, about uh, 10 million people. If we're talking about war peace, I try to, uh, we are working for the project for 10,000 uh, 10, people. And a certain percent money going to donation for United Nations, seven pounds. This one, uh, what you asked me, write down this one. Uh, even this morning, the the, the, the 17, the United Nations, the, the division of the, uh, the, the United Nations, we are happy to get the, the War Peace and War and the donate certain percentage to help the United Nations working for War Peace project. This one is what it teaches me. I write down. The, 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 the spiritual peace in Germany, the spiritual the peace in France, the speech the speech of Nigeria, the speech of the UK, the, the United States. <coughs> so what he asked me to write down this one, how to promote the peace for worldwide. Thank you. Uh, I can continue to talk, but thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we go into the dinner hour, I would like to, I think it's important that Wally somewhere back there should say a few words. Um, this is uh, his endeavor and his energy, and I don't know where he gets his energy, and I want him to tell me the vitamins he takes. <laughs> Wally, can you hear me? And a voice comes. Is Wally back? I don't see him. Yeah, okay. I'm waiting for Wally and then we'll 